Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Marketing Masterclass, which we are streaming live on LinkedIn. So thank you very much for joining us live. Uh, today, we are talking to Kate Clark all about content and social media support. So before we say hello to Kate, I just thought I would introduce myself um, because you may be new to the channel and we are new to the platform, certainly. So my name is Simon Batchelor. I'm one of the co-founders of Better, Bolder, Braver, and I'm joined by Francis. Do you want to introduce yourself, Francis? Thank you, Simon. Hi, everyone. My name is Francis Halaschi, and I am the other co-founder of the Better, Bolder, Braver Community for Coaching. And on that note, I will also say a couple of words about you, Kate, and us and how we met. Um, actually, I can't quite remember how we met. So I think the first thing we're going to do is talk, uh, ask you to uh, let us know how you found us. And I'd also like you to um, tell us a bit about yourself and what your background is and how you come to be doing what you're doing. Uh, you're now in our marketing family, as we like to call it, of other kind of marketing experts. Love it. <laughs> um, and so, yes, your experience is, is going to be really interesting to hear. So would you like to let us know, yes, how you're arriving and what you're bringing to this conversation? Of course. So, yes, I am the owner of Kate Clark Marketing and I help um, health and well-being business owners particularly coaches and health coaches to understand what their content marketing strategies need to be so what do they want to create and how do they want to present themselves to the world and understanding their niche audience in you know more detail and getting down deeper into what their uh, what their ambitions are and what they want from you um, and yeah I do that through uh, I'm developing my own kind of coaching and mentoring programs and courses which I'm delving into to help people do the real practical stuff as well uh, like setting up new email newsletters and whatever else it, else it is that they need to get you know get their message out there. Um, I started my marketing journey way back in 2006 uh, worked my way up through you know the, the corporate ladder as it was and did my marketing qualifications was happily trundling through life as you are as you do and, and got to a point in my career where uh, I realized that the path I, I was on wasn't really the one that I wanted and I was working for a corporate business managing multiple divisions um, and yeah, it just it just didn't it didn't feel right anymore. The 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 path, the managing a big team and being a director, and it wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of females to um, in the kind of industry to inspire, to look up to, to think that's where I want to be in life. And at that point, I was thinking about getting married and having children, as you do, and thinking about what that looks like as as you know you've got a family. And um, yeah, I got married and started trying for a baby and it didn't quite work out the way I wanted. So during this time was when I really, really got to fall in love with my health and well-being. I went on quite a journey for, took us three years to, it does have a happy ending because I ended up with twins. Um, but th those three years were quite a dark time for me. And I went on a very spiritual journey and understanding myself, my health, my nutrition. I mean, anybody that's been through the journey or knows anybody will know that you are a woman possessed and you will do anything and try anything. And for me, it was that it was the natural holistic practices that really, um, that really caught my eye, I suppose, and made me want to know more about them. And I got, I got, yeah, obsessed with, all kinds of things and tried everything but it, it sparked a love a love of all all things health and well-being and nutrition and and spirituality and all of it I just love it love it all uh so that's kind of like when I then when I then had my twins and when I went back to work part-time and I started plotting what like what that journey then looked like for me and I knew I needed the flexibility for 
family life and I knew that working with other people that were improving people's health and well-being in women's health or any kind of health but I think the women's health obviously has a big has a big impact on me so it's a big a big passion of mine um was where I wanted to be and it was who I wanted to help so that's that's why I went down that road really to help other other business owners to just amplify their message and get themselves out there because it's just such an important message to to get out into the world for me thank you um there isn't a little heart button here but if there was <laughs> uh yeah i mean you know we are singing from the same hymn sheet in that we are also really trying to support people who we feel are gifting the world something or enabling others to be able to do so with more confidence and joy how do you uh do your work in terms of the practicals what does it look like what does the support that you offer people now look like and and how secondly how does that give you confidence and joy or what confidence and joy do you bring into that work i um so the way that i help people is it's it's very interesting obviously with when you're the face of your business and um it is your voice it's your voice and your experiences that are the most important thing so like i don't get involved in any writing of content at all that's just not my bag my um the way that I like to help people is to support people to understand well what is their you know what are their values and how are they communicating those or what do, what are their audience's needs and how are they communicating those and then often you know I work a lot with people that are have you know all these ideas but they just they need that structure to understand well what's the plan and what's the structure and what's the processes that they need to go through so it's kind of it's that you know looking at what what is it that you need to create and how do you then put that together and how do you do it in a way that a is is playing on your strengths and who you are and how you love to show up in the world you whether it be speaking or on video or writing or you know, people need to do what is good for them but also like what how is you how are your customers then consuming content because it's all good you know if you're great on video but if your customers aren't actually consuming video then the two things are never gonna meet anywhere are they so it's like it's just helping people understand like what it is that they need to be doing and then the practicalities of you know for me I'm, I'm I love technology and I love automating things and making things easier for people so it's what is that process and you know how can you make it easy because it's you you especially if you're working on your own you've got to make things as simple as you can with the resources that you've got and the time that you've got so that is very very important I believe to to make sure that you're doing that mm. and so, especially I'm guessing for the audience that you like to work with they're not the kind of people having decided they want to get into well-being uh that probably won't spend 12 hours a day no because it, it's completely opposite to their own values isn't it we don't want to spend time on a screen because that's not good for our health and that's completely understandable so yeah how do you do that and balance your own your own needs and your own well-being mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there's a conflict there isn't there because on the one hand we're saying you know we want to support you in sharing this message the channels that tend to be where you are going to likely share it best are on social media, um, you know, through video. And how do you work with people who may well be inclined to kind of show up in the universe in a different way to kind of use their skill sets to, uh, you know, spread the good word, if you like? Yeah, I guess um, getting people to a point where they feel comfortable with some sort of social I think it's possible to do it without but if that's where your audience really is spending a lot of time then yeah like what are the ways that we can do this if it's like I've got one client who is um 
he's amazing in front of the camera. Like he's got so much magnetism. And it was a case of thinking, right, well, we need to get you in front of the camera, but then what can I do to support you to then distribute that in, in multiple places or repurpose that content? I mean, video is a great way of repurposing too, isn't it, right? Because you can, you can get so much out of the video. You can transcribe that, stick it into a blog post and, and get it on, take quotes out of it and get it onto social media platforms. So uh, I can help them with, you know, getting the designs and the graphics created from from the words that they've put together and the words that they've said on on that video so repurposing a thing or just thinking about how they can create it easily and simply and then how can we repurpose that and get it out onto channels without it being too much of a, a stress for them love that so much because we i suppose the the kind of point of tension for us is on the one hand in our community we want coaches to feel in, empowered to produce content themselves mm. um, and we see that some people think that if they pay someone else to do their marketing for them that means they're kind of relieved of the responsibility if you like and we're trying to get oh. people to you know sort of enjoy putting themselves out there because it's it's part of their practice of, of coaching out loud as we call it yeah um, but what I love about what you're saying is that there's a point at which you can be extremely creative and still then look for support for some yes. of the things that might be like unnecessarily an energy sap. Yes. Um, but will be really good for your business. Kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Because <laughs> when you think about content creation and, and the whole well, the whole content process, when you break it down into all of those steps of this is how you plan and do your audience research and then you create the content and then there's a process from that depending on what you're doing whether it be podcast or video or blog you've got there's a whole you know you've got to write it you've got to edit it you've got to get it on the website you you know it's and if you broke that down into so many processes there's lots of ways that you can get support there depending on which part again it's an energy drainer it's taken way too much time and is it something that you could if you did it over time you could improve that and, and it'd get better or would it just literally drain your energy so much that you just wouldn't do it at all mm. you'd just there'd be a, a, a an avoidance there so um yeah I think taking it back it's it's understanding those things isn't it it's really what is the hell yeah that's great or hell god that hate that feels awful and it's getting into your into your that full body feeling of what it is that you that you you, it feels good or it doesn't feel good um and yeah like how can you then um like you can use tools to time yourself you know like toggle time yourself and see how long it takes and if it is taking absolutely ages to edit a video or to even just upload it um yeah there's loads of, there's just so many different stages of the process isn't there mm. to get the support Simon what are your thoughts on outsourcing if you like or sharing the load when it comes to marketing content? Well, I think it's definitely about finding where your strengths lie and playing to those because there's no point, you know, wasting hours and hours going round and round in circles trying to do something when, in fact, if you only have a limited amount of time, someone else could be helping you with that. I think also there are just some things that aren't people's strengths. So, for example, like we use a copy editor for our content mm. um, because it's it's just something I, I just can't do. I mean, I'm dyslexic, so I can't proofread anything I've written because my brain just knows what I've written, so it doesn't read it. Um, so I, I don't read anything to check. I can't yeah. proofread anything. <clears throat> um, so therefore, we use someone else to do that, and that's a long-term relationship. I mean, I've been working with our copywriter for four years, maybe five years now. Wow. So, you know, he's written about the topic so much now that he just knows the topic do you know what I mean it's you get to that point where actually there are some things where he'll be like oh we could reference what you wrote about that in this uh, book here amazing. and I'm like oh well, there you go that's really good you know it's he's adding value it's not like it's taking away from the creative process um mm -hmm. I think that differs however from me going here is a blog title write an entire blog Mm -hmm. to someone you've never worked with or you've gotten to write two or three blogs mm -hmm. that 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 isn't going to work 
like yes you might get a blog out of it or you use something like um is it copify i think there is there's like a service where you pay like 15 dollars and they write you a blog or something wow and i mean it it or there's like um there's some ai ones now where you can give it the blog title in about five keywords and it will make a fairly coherent blog you know to the point <clears throat> where if you're talking about a general topic you it, it is good enough if you just need to fill a blog with 50 yeah. blogs then yeah sure ai can do that for you but and that's a different type of marketing though isn't it yeah, totally exactly different. and but but I think that that's what I often hear when people say, "Oh well, I want someone to do my marketing for me," or "Can I not just pay someone else to do this?" It's like, well, you can, but it won't work. And the reason it won't work is because you're not in the marketing. And when you're in coaching, you're selling you. Yeah. So if you're not in the marketing, if you're not the origin of the creativity or the idea or the concept or the method within your content, then your content isn't going to work because it's not about. It's, it's, it's not connected to you or your work. It's got no integrity in it. So I think there, there are definitely tools and people out there who can who can help with that sort of more, should we say, generalist area of marketing. For sure, there's a lot of tools and people. But to me, the interesting bit comes from making a creative workflow. Like you were saying with that person you work with, you start to the video and then you turn it into other things. Mm. That's a great use of an external person to turn a creative thing into many different other creative things yeah. and that's 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 just a smart way of working I think so mm. I'm really interested to to hear that that's that's kind of one no, I'm reassured to hear that that's working <laughs> yes absolutely and I think the um you know part of that process as well is the distribution side is where a lot of people will then fall down because they might then create this you know, put a lot of thought and effort in research and all of that into one blog post or one video or whatever, but then, um, you know, repurposing it allows you to then get it to uh, a bigger audience and then get it, you know, in different places where it everyone, look, you know, learns in different ways and whether it be reading or watching or mm -hmm. listening. Like, so, um, so yeah, like the distribution side, I think is, is, is big. Without, obviously, I mean, with social media, as long as you you repurposing and using those words and in the post that they're putting out um but the actual engagement side is very different um and i think i think using somebody from a you know social media management where they're doing the whole process and actually engaging as them again that's where the kind of the you, you just don't get yourself coming across there mm -hmm. you can tell can't you from the other side you know when it's them and when it's just a yeah general and I think there is an element of scale there where you may start off on Instagram and be able to reply to all the messages but then you may get to a point where you simply can't you just have yeah. to have someone else but I think then it's a case of saying being up front and saying hey I manage this on behalf of you know or hey I'm the manager of this channel you know that's fine you know as long as you're up front about it but yeah I think the thing is, I think what you said earlier is it's important to know where your audience are hanging out and go there. Mm. So as you said, like if that person who makes the videos, he loves making video, but yet their audience are, you know, avid readers, then yeah, yeah it's like you, you need to just turn them into blogs ultimately. But similarly, I think it's like that leap from video to podcast or podcast to video because you can film them both at the same time, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Obviously, the purists out there would disagree, but like you, mm. you can make complementary content from those two things. Yeah. And I think you know if you're, you know, if you're trying to connect with people who are busy, let's say professionals who are often moving from meeting to meeting, then doing a half-hour YouTube video is never going to reach them. No, that's it. Exactly, yeah. It's got to be two minutes, three minutes mm. tops. So it's chunking, isn't it? It's like going, right, I need to chunk that down into smaller bits for them to make yeah. it easier to digest. Whereas someone who, if you're going after a creative person and you want to work with them in the creative process, then a two-minute prompt might not be what they need. What mm. you might need is like a 20-minute to half-hour guided thought almost like a guided meditation that they can walk with or mm -hmm. paint to or draw to, 
You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's getting inside that person's mind and thinking, what's going to get them thinking? What's going to inspire them to actually do something mm. that is in in connection to or in, in service of the work that I would do with them or do do with them? Nice. I'm curious to know, Kate, where you're, you're in our community, which is wonderful. So yeah. you're familiar with the journey of consciousness. Um, yeah. Where in the journey of content creation do you most like to support people? Are they coming to you with absolutely no idea of what Simon's talking about? Um, or are they, do they have lots of juices flowing and they just don't know the medium? Or, you know, are they already producing and then they don't know where to distribute it? Can you identify a point at which you get the most joy from working with someone? Um, the idea generation stage. So when somebody comes to me where they're comfortable with the um, the kind of content creation side. So like they love to be on video, but they don't necessarily like they know who their audience is, but they don't really understand them. And like they don't really know where to start with, you know, looking at themes and how to create and how to translate that into what actual content to create or, you know, looking at their values and how they're actually putting those values across. Uh, into the world so that idea kind of stage is I, I love that um and I think there's probably like the end bit as well with the repurposing bit like I love to like in my old job I used to have part of the job I mean I used to work for a company that created so much content they had um experts in in their field and there was just there was just loads of it and it was like going in and actually looking at that content and thinking right what can we do with this to make it more strategic so we can repurpose it and, and get it out there at, at the right time for people but how can we break that down you know like being able to take one big blog post and, and create loads of stuff out of it like I love doing that that's 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 another big another big bit so yeah it's kind of like two ends of the spectrum really mm -hmm. No, I love that. And also there's a massive education piece around, um, as Simon says, you kind of need to see the same thing 11 times rather than mm. 4 million things in a way that it's just not going to land. And actually people assume, don't they, that they just need to be churning out more and more stuff when in fact it is completely counterproductive. In fact, mm. so you're better off with one video, as Simon says, and as you say, to then turn and turn, chunk up into many, many more bits that echo the original if you like or yeah um, yeah and I can see how that's a big turn on to help people transition from in an understanding yeah so you know there, there are people in our community who as you say are sort of they've got lots to say and they really want to and they they kind of know who they want to work with mm -hmm. um so where where do you go from there like what what in what way do you support them in, in creating the, the content? And then how do you like to work with people on a sort of time basis, if you like? Um, by time basis, do you mean like, like whether it be over six months or no, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, like when people have got loads of ideas, uh, it's a case of like trying to give it some structure then like, um, where do those ideas fit? I mean, with the 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 journey of consciousness, which um, you know, would, in the past I would have called it the buyer journey, but the journey of consciousness is so much so much better. Uh, where would it? You know, where would their, all their ideas and all their content fit into that process? In terms of, well, have you got enough at each of these stages? And what's the structure how does that calendar look over the year like you've got your calendar when are your when are your business launches when do you need to actually you know be on the calendar and then what other days or causes or things that are link back to your values and how you want to show up in the world where do they sit on the calendar and then where then does this content fit into in in those kind of themes so if you were looking at each month as a mini campaign have you got enough content then to support each of those and it and it's telling the story from the journey of consciousness so it's giving it that structure so it's putting the ideas and giving it the structure and then and then taking it from there so in terms of like how i would work with people so 
in terms of time, I think at the moment I've got like a, I do a one-off session, which is 90 minutes of just like focused time of depending on what it is that they want. So I do a mini audit before we even get on that call and they do a, a, a questionnaire of exactly what they want to get out of it. So those 90 minutes are really focused on what they want to get out of it in the end. And then, um, you know, I do a follow up after 30 days to see where they've got with the action plan that we, that we put together. So I, I, can, I like doing those little bursts with people. But I think to get real value, I got a six month program and I, and I did six months because I think for them to see, you know, their own transformation and their own confidence building like a good long chunk of time. And to go through all of those processes, you know, all of those processes that we've talked about in terms of the from the creation right through to the distribution. So it takes a long time to kind of get them comfortable in each of those stages of the process as well. So I think well, I prefer to work with people on a longer, a longer term basis. Hmm. Simon, any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's interesting to map out the 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 content because it's difficult when you're thinking of it you're on on your own to sometimes to see the wood for the trees in the sense that you know you can come up with lots of different titles and you can come up with lots of different ideas or mm. topics you want to discuss and it's that thing of like making sure you have got that spread so you've got a little bit of content for those people who don't even know about you or you don't even know about the problems or the opportunities for change that you work with and that's often the kind of hardest one to write about because you actually weirdly have to write the least. And there's mm. that phrase, isn't there? It's like, um, uh, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have time. And it's that it takes a long time to really refine down your message. And I think that's what people often struggle with. It's like, if I ask, you know, many of the coaches in our community to write about what they do, they could probably write me four or 5,000 words in one sitting without coming up for air. But if I ask them to do it in 200 words and they can't use any coaching language, that's that's a month's work, you know. It's a life's work in many ways. It's like getting it really distilled down takes time. So I think what you were saying then about, like, just externally auditing that content is really interesting because I think there's a lot of value in that, in saying, well, this is great. Like, you've written about this here, but you've written about it assuming that people know X, Y, Z, so they're here on the journey of consciousness, whereas actually you could write pretty much the same content, but we could repurpose it for people who are unaware and we could split that into two or three things. And sometimes that's all it takes, isn't it? It's just an objective look at the content you've made. So in yeah. do you find that there's a mix of lengths or formats that, that you keep coming back to, or do you find it... Um, or, or, or do you find it's different every time? Yeah, different every time. It, it really does depend on who I'm working with. Some, like you say, will write essays and essays of stuff, which is great because then I've got loads to work with. But it's um, it's then making it succinct and um, giving it structure. So if somebody was to you know write a blog and it's it might just be loads of chunks of text and it's like right well what are we actually trying to say here and you know how do we put that into sections and give it good titles and you know just that that kind of that process so yeah I'm so and, and, I, and it's sometimes it's the other way it's like you know drawing stuff out can be a challenge at times and actually getting enough to, to make a nice big chunky piece of content Mm. Um, do you find that you're having to help people think about what's reasonable in terms of uh, what they might like to achieve in the time that they work with you and kind of secondary but in complement to that how do you manage people's sort of expectations of what good looks like how do you assess what a successful campaign is and then mm. communicate with them around that well that's interesting because I think, um, yeah, I, th I don't think I can answer that question very easily, to be honest. 
I think managing their expectations on how much they can achieve in the time that they've got, I think, yeah, you you need to be, or I need to be very kind of strict on that because it can, it can go, it can go off in, you know, all different directions very, very easily and stuff can get added on top. So it's kind of like, right, oh, this is, yeah, this is what we're going to do in this time. And I've had to be more strict with what that, you know what the kind of like terms and conditions are i suppose or what the outputs mm. are and um but yeah like in terms of like what a successful campaign looks like again it's a case of testing and seeing what their audience reacts well to and uh yeah i don't think i can i don't think i can answer that one that easily no i understand it's you know we we i think people get hung up on that they can't articulate the outcomes of working with them. Yeah. Um, so what we support them with is articulating how they can provide the structure for emergence or the structure for testing, as you say. Mm. So what someone's getting from working with you is a structure for testing where otherwise there would not be a structure for testing. Yeah. But you will not have the answers necessarily. You will have a really robust structure for testing what works and what doesn't work. And that will iterate as it goes along, right? Yeah. But that's you know, the outcome is they will have a structure, yeah. not that they will make three million pounds. Oh, yeah. You know? Like I can never, ever give anybody any, you know, guarantees on, you know, you're going to get 10,000 followers. And that's just not mm. I, I definitely don't ever no make any of those kind of that's it and we so we don't like those claims for two reasons one is uh you know if you do 10x your income if it's the income uh sort of metrics then it's at what expense to mm. yourself to your mental health and to your family yeah <laughs> and then the other metrics which is um metric sorry uh is three million followers so what you know, and the responsibility that comes with uh, sort of managing how that makes somebody feel or the lack of it is just something we find very, it's an enormous minefield, mental yeah. health minefield. Yeah. So we also try and move people away from that way of thinking as fast as possible because it's just not productive or particularly healthy. No, I hung up on those vanity metrics, as it were, of how many likes they're getting and yeah like you say not good for mental health because you you just just get stuck um constantly checking your social media don't you and mm. then spending way too much time on online yeah we have a we have a program that we have called creating conversations because for us success is when you've been able to have a conversation with someone that you're interested to hear more about yeah. so that then if you do have a service that's uh, useful to them you can make sure they're aware of it so yeah. you know what do you like to say that you're creating for people if you like or supporting them and creating connection yeah like I use that a lot like what what can we do to create that connection with your audience like yeah you know making those I guess it's the similar thing it's like creating the conversations it's creating the connections yeah mm. and confidence I guess as well for your yeah. people as well and you know we're we're supporting coaches but we understand looking at for example the yoga industry that there's a hell of a lot of practice that goes on in the yoga studio that that is very much at odds with how people then are showing up on social media and the imperfection wow. that is talked about in the yoga studio is the complete opposite of the kind of thing that people are then thinking they need to do on social media so oh, that's right, very yeah. conflicting doesn't yeah. it yeah I can see that now you've said it yeah mm -hmm. yeah um and I guess you're seeing that in the in the number of different streams of well-being that you're working in that there must be a sort of uh contradiction in terms of the work and then the marketing practice are you seeing that those trends uh, I can't say massively. No, not for. I mean, perfection. Perfection is a funny one that comes up a lot, isn't it? The you know this idea that people need to show up in this perfect way. Um, I think I would definitely help people 
if somebody was in that mind frame, I would definitely part of that process would be to give them confidence to just show up rather than feel like it needs to be perfect all the time. And uh, that's definitely part of how I work with people. And, you know, being able to make mistakes and try things is part of the creative process, isn't it? As well as it's important for anyone you're trying to offer a well-being service to to understand about themselves as well so if you can model it Uh, then mm -hmm. that's great because then people will think that that's what good looks like it's just being a human being so yeah be a bit more human yeah exactly i mean any other questions that you have for kate or thoughts i think it's interesting around the vanity metrics because it's you know the 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 platforms are designed to get people to come back in. That is that is their business model. You know, and obviously they've got shareholders who need to see time in app attention spent on the app increasing month on month. So the the platforms have a vested interest in making those vanity metrics very appealing. Mm. And obviously, from a non business point of view if we step away from the business side just from an average user point of view it is just the vanity metric is what they want isn't it it's the validation it's the status it's the status badge you get of how many followers you have and how many likes you're getting and that's the status of of what it is it's the game they're playing but then from a business point of view it's like it's really hard to be involved in that and not be invested in that or affected by that or influenced by that because you know, these companies have spent millions, if not hundreds of millions, weaponizing that against you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I I think whenever I talk about it, I'm always like, this isn't a judgment, it's an acknowledgement that yeah. vanity metrics are there and they're really addictive and they work, but that's yeah. because this is a hundred million, if not billion dollar industry you're sat on the receiving end of. So you don't stand a chance. But being able to objectively step back and be like, okay, so this one didn't land. I didn't get as many views, didn't get as many likes, didn't get as many interactions on this one. Not a problem. What I try and say to people is, well, that doesn't mean that what you said or the topic wasn't right. It just means that the particular way and the particular time at which that landed in the platform didn't work. Mm. So can you use a different analogy? Could you just re-record it in a different way? Could you say basically the same thing, not word for word, but could you just have another run at it yeah. and try it again? It's not like it's it's gone, that idea is gone and, you know, in the bin now. We can never talk about that again. It's And I think that's how it can sometimes feel when you're looking at those apps. Um, so I think there's there's like two things. So that that would be my, my, my first sort of thought is this... Um, vanity metrics are are really hard to move beyond and they're they are yeah. useful but as a barometer they're like a weather vane aren't they which way is the wind coming from but beyond that can't tell you when it's going to rain it's not, you know, it's no not- and and it's usually like i find that a lot of people that i work with um there's a lot of sensitive subjects that people don't necessarily want to be seen online interacting with so it doesn't necessarily mean that you're content isn't inspiring or having Mm. an effect on people either i think getting caught in that um looking at the analytics all the time and like you say if you pair that with if it's sent at the wrong time and the wind isn't blowing in the right direction at that particular moment you know there could be something else online that's just taking the Mm -hmm. precedent you know it could be so many different things couldn't it um yeah, I think, and that's again where the repurposing comes in useful because if you've got a workflow to repurpose the same message, maybe in different ways with different titles or different images, then you can start to see a bit of a difference there as well. That's such an amazingly important point, I think. And there's a number of people in our community who are talking about work uh, that, you know, might just touch a nerve or Mm -hmm. you know we'll get somebody over the line from unaware to aware Mm -hmm. um about a thing but maybe it won't be in that moment you know they'll have read it and then be like whoa hang on I think I saw something about that yesterday and I've just had a moment um and like you say they won't want to interact 
And I want to relate this to a really important point that Simon makes to our community members, which is there's very little point having really profound content if you don't have anywhere to point people to. And so we work really hard to get people, uh, Simon has designed our coaches marketing plan. And Simon says, you know, don't even start planning anything if you haven't got a place where you're supposed to be bringing people to so that, you know, your hard work is reward, you know, rewards you because they then understand the who, what, why, and then how to book a call and what your method is and how you can work with someone. Mm. So what do you do if somebody's churning out incredible content or providing you with the most amazing blog posts or videos? At what point do you look at their website and think, hang on a minute, and what? <laughs> yes. What are they going to do next? Yeah, the process. Like, um, I encourage a lot of my clients to get their newsletters set up and their, and their mailing list because, like you say, if you're putting stuff out there and people – on interacting with it on social they're going to come want to come somewhere to join your world and and be part of that and I think getting them onto a mailing list is uh, the best place for it because then you've got you, you know that they are interested you know where they are in their journey of consciousness and you've got the opportunity to to build that relationship with them there and I think in the position that we're at now with with social media channels which you know could disappear tomorrow uh, algorithm changes could mean that they, they they're in charge of what who sees your content and and they're in charge of the relationship that you have with your clients or your potential clients or your audience um so yeah like that's kind of like i'm i'm, I'm always what's the next logical step for that person no, I was I love about that that you could almost be brave and say please do not comment on this uh <laughs> you know, but do what is best for you which is you know to come and join the mailing list yeah where then we can have a kind of offline relationship if that would be uh you know of most use to you in mind of we don't know where any of these bits and bobs on social media are going to go not to scaremonger people but it's almost like you don't need to show me here that you like this you know, I'm putting it out there for you. <clears throat> Feel free to like come and tell me that it was useful, or or just sign up, and then I'll know that something I've said is is of use to you, and that's enough for me. You know, I really like that. Yeah, yeah. It's clever. It's clever as well, like you say, not just to have this amazing website to point people to that outlines your services, because, like you say you don't know where people are on their journey of consciousness when they when they get there and and it's great for us to be able to then offer more to them if we do when we know where they are because then we can ask them the next penetrating question <laughs> or yes. take them to the next bit of the journey yeah mm. i think one of the other things we spoke about is um that comparison trap of looking at what someone else is doing or seeing what someone else is putting out on social and then making a number of assumptions about their life and or business or both and then trying to mimic or re replicate that and I yeah. think it's it's very really easy particularly in the sort of wellness space to see someone else is in you know very beautifully created um grid of lifestyle images that they've either paid someone else to take or have spent a lot of time you know grooming those photos to look incredible yeah. and it's like that's great but what does that actually tell you about them they tell you a it tells you they can afford a photographer or a nice phone and they can afford time to take photos but beyond that it tells you nothing mm -hmm. but it's that thing of like if you're selling the lifestyle if you're selling a belief system if you're selling a method that the outcome of which is you get this lifestyle, then you are kind of in, in doing that kind of marketing. But I think it's important for people to take a step back and think, well, actually, is that what I'm selling? Am I selling the lifestyle? Am mm. I trying to sell what they're selling? Am I trying to do what they're doing? And it's about picking 
someone if, if you are going to compare to someone picking someone who's at least going in the same direction because sometimes people have been oh but this person's got like a video series and they've got a like a like a you know book and a a program and one-to-one and all and so i need all of that if i'm even going to get going on social media it's like you don't need all of that it's just you've got to be careful i think of of, of who you kind of compare yourself to in the sense that there's a lot of people out there who are who are doing what uh, what might seem like it's the same thing, but it's actually completely different. Um, so do you do you find that that people often fall into that trap, or are people generally fairly good at uh, finding the right people to compare to? Sometimes, yeah. When you get down the road of um, competitor analysis and looking what's out there and you know i try and help people to understand that when we're looking at competitors it's to it's to understand maybe what part of the process that they're not doing that you can fill the gap on mm-hmm. um or what what are they doing that you could actually do better um but yeah like you do sometimes get clients where they'll point you to a certain website and they they will say i want to do this and be like this person it's like right okay let's let's look at that and how you know where's that coming from and um what parts do you actually like about this this person or you know what they're creating and yeah i think they you've got to be mindful of that Mm. i was watching a seth godin video the other day and he was saying you know the client who chooses your competitor is still right because that was the right choice for them. Yeah. What you need to do is understand why did they make that choice and then look at, well, actually, if that's the right choice for them, competing with that choice isn't going to get anybody anywhere. What can you do that's different to offer someone an alternative, a different way of looking at it? Mm. And I think that's a really sort of seems like a much better way of, of coming at designing products and services, not like, well, I need to do all of that plus this in order to win that decision. It's like, no, take a step back and think, well, if you're in their shoes, how can you offer them a different, something different on the on the other end of that scale yeah. or next to, perpendicular to, you know, what is the, what's the slightly different angle that they're not doing mm. that, that people still want, obviously, but like, how can you turn this around 90 degrees and give something different to consider? Mm. So I think that can be a fun one to play with in the in in when you're looking at other people or yeah, competitor analysis even. Yeah. Or as um George Cow talks about um niche friends. <laughs> I really like the way that he puts it. He doesn't call them competitors, he calls them niche friends because they're mm-hmm. there aren't, you know, they're it's about you know collaborating and and looking at it in a different way yeah yeah well, if anyone doesn't know george cow is by the way he wrote the book content marketing authentic content marketing which mm-hmm. is a fantastic book and he has some real practical tips on uh creating content and measuring and understanding how to create that that process of uh testing and and uh, being agile with it i mm. really like i really like his stuff yeah, yeah, there's a lot of wisdom there. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think there is that thing of just it is particularly in coaching where often people go from not knowing that coaching is a thing to being bombarded like everywhere they go, there's coaches. It's like the, for me, the, the jump seems massive. As soon as you are aware that coaching is a thing, every other person you meet is going to be a coach. It's really yeah. fun suddenly they come out of the woodwork they're everywhere and it's, it's that overwhelm of choice and yeah. i think people if, if you if you're as a coach in particular focusing on competing with someone else or trying to look at what else is happening for that person that sorry with, with that business and trying to de- no, uh, reverse engineer it actually you're losing that focus it needs to be it's a it's like boiling it right down to the empathy of like what do they what do they really need like what's the underlying need they're looking for and then 
what are they presenting as wants? So what are they saying? Actually, my want is this, even if they're not able to articulate that need and how you start to speak to those things in your marketing. And then you can, that's how you differentiate, not by going, well, they offer one hour, so I'm going to offer one hour, 15 minutes. So <laughs> they, get, they, get, they get a bit more, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I, I, the niche friends phrase is very good. Someone has commented on LinkedIn saying it's a great way to think about it. Yeah, mm. the niche friends is good. Um, yeah, so in terms of like what does what would you say, like if someone is sat there looking at their their list of ideas or maybe even let's, let's go one stage back. Let's just say someone's just sitting there looking at a blank page going like, I, I, I want to post on LinkedIn. I just don't know where to start. What, do you have like a, what would you say to someone who came to you who's looking to start posting on, let's say LinkedIn, because we're live on LinkedIn? <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I start the process, whether it be LinkedIn, email or whatever content, I always start the process with looking at that audience, the market research and the audience research. So um, doing, speaking to your audience and, or, doing some research in uh, review sites or Facebook groups and actually understanding the language that people are using and then do using a, a you know a few online tools like answer the public or uber suggest mm. or things like where you can go and put your keywords in and see what content is actually being shared online and then like uh, kind of bringing all that together and, and making a structure and then whether it be posting it on LinkedIn, you know or wherever it is it's it's again coming back to that that structure of putting it into the the content calendar and breaking it down so that you, you you're strategic through the year then you're not just thinking oh what shall i post this week you know it's mm. it's much more strategic than that it's well, what do i need to post across the year and what is important right now yeah excellent that's really good um francis did you have any other questions or thoughts Thank you. Uh, I guess I'm really curious to know, Kate, because you're in our community. So, you know, you've obviously got such a wealth of knowledge anyway. Um, what's been useful to you? Is it the stuff that we talk about in terms of the levels of awareness or and I'm thinking about your own service and product? We've talked so much about other people's uh, sort of products and services and how they're building uh their own awareness of their of their niche audience and you know sort of where we want where they need to take people what's your what take away from better bolder braver in terms of your own product production if you like you know where are you in your own if you can round us off with sort of where where you're at in your journey that would be really wonderful to hear yeah it's always an ongoing process isn't it so I've really loved starting on the, the coach's marketing journey and going through the the values and the niche the niche audience stuff and um, that's kind of where I'm up to at the minute with going through the journey and and yeah like I always I'm coming back to how can I serve a different niche better or can can I niche it down even more and um, yeah I think for me you know I, I started with well-being and then I moved to health coaches and even nutritionists at one point I was like do shall I just focus on nutrition because nutrition was such a big part of of my journey um, and then I'm thinking well maybe I should focus more just on women women's health and that you know that time of life of women's health and that encompasses so many different kinds of of um of health and well-being and coaching in different areas whether it be mind or body or whatever and uh, so yeah i mean it's all it's it's a it's an ongoing process and i've been in business for three years but i think this year it feels very different this year almost feels like the first year uh after everything that's happened over the past few years it's like you know i've almost started again so i almost feel like i'm in year one not year three of my own business but yeah it's a, it's a it's an ongoing iteration and and evolution shall we say 100 percent. and you know as we always say to people let's say for argument's sake that you were very very targeted in your own marketing towards um all the practitioners 
So rather than, you know, yoga teachers or coaches or nutritionists, it's everybody that is helping women when they're trying to conceive. Yeah. You, know, you get such a range because I think people's fear is if they niche, they're going to then have like one kind of person. Yeah. Where you can be really clear that what you care about is supporting this phenomenon that you feel is under discussed, under supported. Yeah. That there's an education piece for the world around how it feels for a couple trying to conceive or an individual trying to conceive mm-hmm. and struggling and that you want to look after all the people that are looking after those people yeah you know, it starts to feel like you really understand that that you can look after a range of people all of whom as you say are kind of niche friends looking mm. after same target audience yeah and it starts to feel so much more friendly less competitive exciting supportive and the big picture shift that you can inform uh, as someone who's come to this with such pertinent experience with such generosity of your own experience mm. is just is really wonderful to see and hear about so we're mm-hmm. really really happy that you're with us and that we're able to support you in understanding more about how you can be clearer for yourself and with others about what you're trying to achieve. So, and thank you. Yes, Thanks yes. for starting this off with such generosity about your own experience as well. And yeah. I'm glad we've kind of ended up on that point as well. Mm-hmm. Full so, circle. Yeah, good job. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Kate. And um, sharing so generously um people i understand can find out more about you on kateclarkmarketing.com for which there will be a link underneath this replay video if you're watching on repeat um if you are joining us live on linkedin you can of course connect with kate right now and start a conversation if you have a burning question please do um and yes we will be back shortly with more live sessions and conversations so we hope that you can join us then but thanks everybody today for listening and watching and we'll see you next time thank you bye